So, um, speaking of earthbound farms, which is a huge industrial organic farm, mm -hmm. um, when you go to the supermarkets these days, there's signs saying that there's been droughts and frosts and that uh, produce is not available, which should give everybody pause to think about food security, uh, that we're dependent on an area that is essentially been um, irrigated and is now facing prolonged droughts and can probably never sustain the, the level of um, production of, of greens and vegetables that we've been expecting. Uh, we've been getting things from Mexico for, uh, we get things from <laughs> New Zealand, none of which is sustainable on any level. Um, are you experiencing any increase in people wanting your produce because of what they're seeing in the supermarkets? Yeah, it, it seems like every, every food scare that happens in the media and uh, every event like this, there's, you know, they're periodic, the E. coli and the spinach and, and uh, yeah, when there's meat, meat regulation issues, we, we just seem to get more and more allies. It, it's, it's that call that, that uh, wakes people up and they think, oh, yeah, that is really scary. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're just we're hearing everything about how that's happening in Egypt and Libya, and really there's you know a, a solid food uh, basis for all of that. People are rising up because the cost of living is just too high, and part of that is the the cost of food is rising, mm -hmm. um, so that people can't feed themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it just it seems like this is all writing on the wall that the bubble that we've been in, the uh, the food system that we've had is not going to be there for us anymore. And I would like to see us be proactive and slowly, slowly rebuild rather than just go, going on a business as usual and then having the crash and then being like people in Cuba where everybody, you know, lost 20 or 30 pounds because they just didn't have food and it's a chronic, a chronic food shortage. The uh, the silver lining in all that is that there's so many people that are involved in food production in Cuba now. Right. When you, I got the chance to go there a couple of years ago, and uh, you you see people that have rabbit hutches in their in their roofs, and every square inch of of uh, what would be lawn is got greens growing yeah, in it. Food production. Yeah, there's cows grazing on boulevards. There's, it's a it's a bustling place, and it. And it's, it kind of adds life to the landscape that is not here, you know? Yeah. It makes everything interesting. You look and think, oh my gosh, yeah, there's lettuce right there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah, there's fruit trees. People are actually pruning them. They're taking care of them. Isn't that interesting? You know, yeah. here there's trees that nobody cares for because, well, you know, it's too much of a, yeah. too much burden to get up there on the ladder and pick the fruit anyway. It, it's interesting that uh, you mentioned Cuba because it is uh, both that 20-year that period where people were um, losing weight because there wasn't enough food and faced with the adversity, they became uh, pretty close to food self-sufficient. So we know that it can be done. Mm -hmm. I prefer your method as well where we do it in a planful way as opposed to because of a crisis. But um, I they did transform uh, from, you know, huge, gigantic uh, sugarcane plantations into uh, primarily organic food grown locally. And, mm -hmm. and so we know it can be done. And we yeah. do have uh, a place, an island, uh, where maybe with ingenuity we could make that transformation happen. Hmm. It's interesting, in Cuba, some of the highest paid people are the farmers. Mm -hmm. And... Um, their socialist system, even though it has its faults, um, has actually bred a, uh, a, a race of super farmers because they get paid, um, they get set up with a contract. Depending on the size of the parcel of land they work, well, the, they might have to feed a hospital or they might have mm. to feed kids lunch every day or they might have to feed you know, a certain neighborhood. Well, if they can do anything above and beyond that, then they can get cash for that food. And so they've just 
um, been Became very more, entrepreneurial. <laughs> yeah, more and more productive. So you can really see how much food you can squeeze out of a square yeah. square foot plot when you go there, and uh, it was pretty inspiring. Actually, you do intensive yeah. farming, don't you? In terms of yeah. squeezing as much as you can out of your plot. yeah, and I guess that's part of the cost of living here is breeding super farmers because <laughs> to make to make a living, you really have to make the land pay. Um, Unlike Cuba, we have a lot of access to, uh, in, in Spanish, you know, more horse manure. If you turn your back, somebody's unloading horse manure at your farm. You know, people are really, we have an abundance of nutrients. We have abundance of compost. We have, um, we, we all have our own truck, you know. At, in Cuba, I just thought, <laughs> gosh, you know, these people are, they have, to work they, have so hard. they have to work so hard to get any little bit of organic matter to make compost. Yeah. And here, we just, it's just all even wasted, you know, I, I, uh, we eat big swaths of grass and I always think, gosh, if somebody in India had this grass, you know, they'd be feeding how many goats that yeah. would be yeah. man manuring how many acres, but here it's just excess. So we do have a lot of abundance. Yeah, I was uh, listening to a uh, uh, ideas program uh, the other day and they were talking about they, they were interviewing a farmer who um, whose farm was replicating the the mm. way uh, things happen in nature so that he would he would take his cattle every, move them every day and and confine them to a patch of grass because ruminants in the wild used to do that they would roam continuously kind of continuous banquet and then they would have birds that would come and and peck through the manure so that it got dispersed and uh, and created the soil and it, you know, it just the science of farming um, is magical really when mm -hmm. you when you think about what you can do on a piece of land and how you can make it more productive because of your own effort. Yeah, and that that knowledge, you know, just appreciating what a farmer can figure out just. Being on the land, being in tune with the cycles, mm. year after year, is uh, is such an argument for letting people be full time farmers. Mm -hmm. There's very few people here that can be a full time farmer. They have to have two jobs because the right. farm doesn't pay, and society doesn't value that time spent on the land, figuring stuff out. Like Joel Salatin, that was the the guy who calls mm. himself a grass farmer. Yeah. All he's doing, he's growing the grass, and then the animals are eating it in succession, and yeah. he's selling the selling the animals so that he can grow better grass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he did talk about mm. how there's a particular level of the shoot that um, is critical, and you don't want to get it too old or too young. Yeah, all that observation, just yeah. not valued, so yeah. we need to value farmers so that they can spend their time figuring out stuff like that, that, that will save us, you know, that kind of farming. It's just so, you know, zero impact. And actually, the land gets more and more fertile the more you farm it in yeah. those ways. So tell me what kind of policies would fix the problem? Um, well, you know, a start would be regional food self-sufficiency targets. Okay. I, um, yeah, I got that idea from my friend Linda Geggy, who works for CR Fair, and she... Um, She's all about just, you know, slow, proactive steps to get more and more of our food supply being local, making room on the supermarket shelves for local, motivating people to uh, learn how to cook that rutabaga. Learn how to, <laughs> I'm always looking for great recipes. There's lots of, on our website, so if anybody wants rutabaga recipes, come on. <laughs> Um, yeah, learning how to eat with the seasons, learning how to um, yeah, appreciate what, what abundance we do have in the wintertime. Um, One of the things uh, in the movie On the Island, On the Edge. Island on the Edge? Yeah, Island on the Edge, thank you. Uh, which is about agriculture on Vancouver Island. Um, there was some discussion about the need for long-term tenures for young farmers because... Mm. Uh, farm often doesn't become uh, really economical for a 10-year period, and so the need for 25, 35, 50-year tenures. Um, the need for uh, financial assistance so that young people can get access to land, matching land to, to young people. Um, are those part of the solutions as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a major way that young people or new farmers get access to land is through... Um, BC tax assessments uh, designation of 
productive farmland. So if, if a landlord who's living on agricultural land but not farming it, um, they can get a reduced tax rate if they lease to a farmer who's going to put that land into production. Um, we better make that more attractive. It, well, it is pretty attractive is now, but one problem with it, with it is that you can just have a year-to-year -year lease. Mm -hmm. um, so what should be the case is that there's no tax incentive unless you sign a 10-year, wouldn't that be nice, a 10-year lease? Nice. And that way a farmer could come onto the land, you know, spend some time really figuring out what, uh, what grows best, spending time putting in infrastructure, having proper fencing so they're not just uh, always battling deer like I am, yeah. um, and, uh, and then making some investment and then, and then being able to realize that investment. Mm -hmm. As it is now, you kind of get a year year to year lease so you look at the land and and you don't farm it with a long-term vision because you don't know if you're going to be there next mm. year it doesn't make sense to invest in a lot of compost to put into the land because you can't bring it with you when you go so i think we could get more responsible farming more uh, production off land and uh, and happier farmers if we could give them a long-term lease yeah that's it and that's interesting because it sounds like the um benefits the tax benefits are already there but we need to tie those to a commitment um, by the landowner to long-term use yeah. of that land for farming, rather mm -hmm. than uh, uh, waiting and seeing to see what the better deal might be next year. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then capital startup funds for farmers. I think a lot of young farmers waste a lot of time because they they can't invest in proper fencing, so mm -hmm. they. Do you, you know, cheap plastic fencing that's right. always breaking. They're spending time putting that up after every snowfall, uh, like I'm going to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, not having the proper equipment to work the land, and so as a result, spending a lot of time and a lot of life force working land that isn't very productive. Whereas if um, in in Quebec they have, they're really interested in food sovereignty because it's it's part of their vision for mm -hmm. separation. So in Quebec, if you uh, commit to farming, um, you get $50,000 to work into your farm plan. You get so business. I was going to ask you the number. Is that the number? 50000 50000 to start up. That would be nice. I don't know anyone personally who's had that cash to, uh, to start up, except one of my friends, Francis, who is farming now in Quebec. And uh, he moved there and bought land with his family. And then he got this, this cash infusion. And so he was able to just get everything he needed. He, uh, he was able to buy an old tractor and then spend time fixing it up, getting neighbors to help. Whereas I'd hesitate to buy a piece of machinery. You know, I could get a good deal on an old tractor, but I don't know if I'm gonna have enough money to repair mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. So I just opt out and go for a rototiller and stay smaller. Mm -hmm. You know, it's those, you can't go out on a limb because you don't, you don't have enough money to, to uh, realize your, your net return. 